Hello, hello, and welcome to World Science Festival Brisbane 2021. My name is Bernie Hobbs, and I am absolutely wrapped to be here with you for what hopefully won't be the last live event for a while, um, but potentially could be. So um, I'm, as I said, absolutely wrapped. We're all excited to hear Gary share with us some stories about the incredible diversity of Australia from his perspective, which is behind the lens. But I really want to start today's session by acknowledging the First Peoples, the traditional custodians of the land on which the festival's being presented. At this time, I also recognise and pay my respects to the first scientists of this land, Increasingly, in many scientific fields, we're recognising the important contribution that First Nations science makes to contemporary scientific discovery. Now, this morning, you're going to be seeing some incredible photos of Queensland's environment. And when I say environment, I shouldn't say one because obviously there are truckloads of them. But it's not going to be like flicking through a beautiful photographic calendar or some wonderful photo album because we'll be hearing the story behind them. We'll be hearing about those environments, how they're related to one another and the bigger picture of our ecosystems and, and climate systems at the moment. Um, but also we'll be hearing some of the technical side of things and what it's like to be a working photographer telling the story of our land through the vision. And the man who's going to do that for us is Queensland Museum's photographer of the last 38 years, Gary Kranich. Um, Hello. Clearly, <laughs> clearly they took Gary on with a box brownie when he was six years old, if he's been here for 38 years. But um, uh, Gary loves his work. He feels incredibly privileged. And not only is he incredibly privileged, we're privileged because he's an internationally renowned photographer. He's been awarded up the hill. Jeez, I've even presented you with an award. You're going so, well here, Bernie. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'll Where keep did you, talking you, you up get all no that time? Uh, yeah. That little bio you sent me. Yeah. yeah. I've, left out, yeah. I've left out some of the bigger compliments because <laughs> when I Googled them, you might be talking yourself up a bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's no. just adding commas and zeros yeah. to things. It's, it's pretty easy. <laughs> nice yeah. work. So how we're going to do it is um, Gary's just going to present us all some of some of his favourite shots, I guess, that really tell these stories. And I'll just be interjecting because, frankly, I'm a bit of a nosy parker and um, with a few questions. And if you can save your questions for the end, we'll have plenty of time then to get to them with Gary. So thank you so much for coming out this morning. I know it was a bit of a bit of a toss up for some of us whether we get into a crowd. So I really appreciate you coming along. But Gary Kranich and the uh, wild um, extreme environments of Queensland, pretty good draw card. So give it up for Gary. Here we go. And Thank you, Bernie. That was a fantastic intro. And that was not easy for me to make up all that stuff about what I've done. <laughs> that, that took quite a bit of time. I didn't put any time into this. <laughs> uh, well, but I mean, you do like we've already seen the the tourism blurb for Queensland, yes. and frankly, we're all Queenslanders, so we know it's a rock and great place to live. But what is so special about Queensland's extreme environments, Gary? It's we have an hour, okay. So I think we'll get through. Most okay, Gary, of it. don't focus on how long you've got yes, to talk. Yes, yes. <laughs> Answer we have the question. An hour. It's an incredible place, Queensland. I mean, in terms of biodiversity alone, it is the most biodiverse place in Australia for a start. It's not as big as Western Australia, as we know, but the habitat types are wide and varied from arid zones to coastal areas to deserts and everything in between. So just beginning, first of all, we can start in the far west of, of the state. This is the Simpson Desert. In terms of an extreme environment, this is a perfect example of one end of the scale to the other. So as I mentioned, Simpson Desert, um, low rainfall, extremely low, low rainfall and not reliable rainfall. So episodic, uh, unreliable, unpredictable, which means there's animal adaptions that happen within these environments as well that are unique. So touching on just the arid zone alone, the extremes of temperature, are probably the thing that uh, uh, you know, more or less drives us to an extreme. Hottest places in, in Australia are in the desert zones. And the Simpson Desert, so this is near Birdsville or? Yeah. For anyone who hasn't been there. Sorry, I need water. You can tell I've been talking all morning. We've been chatting. <laughs> mm. 
So we're just You're outside of Birdsville here. Yeah, we're, we're at, a, at a sand dune called Napananka, Big Red, highest sand dune. And you know, as we know, as you go across the Simpson Desert, the distance between the sand dunes is about the same, about 1,500 metres to 2 k's, up comes another sand dune. They all run east-west, you know, uh, northwest, south, southeast sort of direction based on the prevailing wind. So these locations are also uh, punctuated by strong winds as well. So wind is also part of the game there too. So are the dunes constantly moving because of the wind or they're held in place by... Well, well as you can see, there's always a prevailing uh, wind direction and there's two sides to a sand dune. There's a steep side and a, and a, a, sh a shallow side. Mm -hmm. So usually, you know, prevailing wind flattens the dune, then the other side is steeper. Um, and for many people, crossing the Simpson, Simpson Desert is a bit of a thing, you know? Okay. It, it is a bit of a thing. But it's sort of, it is a location where if things go wrong, things go pear-shaped, you can get yourself into trouble fairly quickly, which is great, isn't it? That's quite nice to know somewhere. We've got places you can just die, you know? That's <laughs> really handy to know, yeah. But on the other side of the coin, not all that far away um, in, in the tropics, the wet tropics, we can go to places where the rainfall is two, three hundred times what you see in the far western corner. So in terms of extremes, these are the wettest places in Australia, not just Queensland. So the rainfall is vastly different, uh, the vegetation completely different. Um, so it absolute polar opposite to what you see in terms of biodiversity. Um, the other story about rainforests, I guess, is that in Queensland, it's not a continuous habitat. It's a fragmented ha habitat. As Queensland has dried out, rainforest pockets have shrunk. Um, and it's led to um, isolation of species, but also led to uh, adaption and a high degree of endemic species in, in those regions. And when you say as Queensland has dried out, do you mean due to habitat loss like land clearing or is that just a general... Long term. Yeah, okay. Long term, you know, if we go back millennia. So that's not something we can be blamed for? How not our fault, Bernie. In Finally something Incredible. that's not our fault. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're not going to take responsibility for that. So, and then after the rainforest, you know, you can jump over to the uh, uh, eastern side of the Great Dividing Range and then the habitats shift and change again. Higher rainfall, but much more diversity in terms of habitat. Coastal plains, dune communities, um, flood plains like this. So most of, all of those eastern rivers flow out to, uh, you know, in, into the Barrier Reef and, and on the Queensland coast. And, you know, sediment and habitat all linked together, lots of river systems flowing out, pretty much heading due east off the Great Dividing so, Range. So, so this different is again. North Queensland? Yeah, so now we're at a place called uh, Gorganga Plain, which is just near Proserpine. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just up on the northern edge here is a Proserpine River. Um, we're not far from Early Beach, so if you like Your to go... Your job really sucks. Yeah, it's just say. cruising around, isn't it? Just, yeah, jumping up, taking pictures, yeah, <laughs> mucking around making up bios, as you heard earlier, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so um, Proserpine River, just on the northern sort of uh, edge of this. So this was uh, in a helicopter, these pictures, and um, yeah. So that's sort of those three kind of key differences yeah. to begin with, I suppose. So that's just giving us a smattering. And I guess we sort of knew that in our minds, but it's great to see that stark comparison now. So you're in a helicopter for this one. Was the last one a helicopter as well or a small plane? That, uh, that was a helicopter as yeah. well, yeah. But in 2019, Gary, um, so I mean you do a bit of aerial photography, but mm. in 2019 your frequent flyer points went absolutely through the roof, which is lucky you got it in then, because you were doing a couple of special projects that involved a lot of flying. So tell mm -hmm. us about those. Okay, so 2019, I embarked on a project uh, to photograph the wetlands of Queensland for one of our major publications. It was a partnership um, deal with the Department of Environment. Um, and a big part of that was obviously trying to cover the entire state and looking at wetland areas in the entire state. So really ambitious thing to take on. I didn't think it was going to take me as long as what it has. I'm still involved in it. Yeah, I feel like you've got the wrong slide up for no. wetlands. No, no, it's okay. I'll tell you why. It's because, um, yeah, unfortunately 2019 in Queensland, great, great year to do uh, wetlands of Queensland. Driest year in history. In, his, in recorded history. Driest year in recorded history in Queensland. Mm. So um, 
part of this project. Did you have to pay the advance back to the publisher? No, no, I could just No, no, I just had to talk my way around that. So, <laughs> interestingly enough, so, so I, I sort of piggybacked on another project which was run out of the University of New South Wales, which is um, an aerial coverage of the east coast of Australia. And this has been running for 38 years. So basically what this group do, they, they look at wetlands and water birds and breeding cycles of those, those species and what goes on in all those locations. So they fly the same transect. So I crisscrossed Queensland about nine times like that, east to west. Wow, it looks like a Pac-Man journey yeah, of Queensland. It was just like yeah. that, yeah. But interestingly enough, in that entire 38 year uh, set of data, 2019, worst ever, driest ever, lowest breeding numbers, and here I am trying to do a book on wetlands of mm. Queensland. Mm. So, Lowest breeding numbers of, of wetland birds? Of, of, they're mainly looking at water birds, but yeah. clearly you know, the, the other part on the edges of that are, are looking at the, the, river, uh, the rivers, the dams, the lakes, mm. and they, they're the same locality they go to mm. each time. So again, well done Gaz, you know, do a book on wetlands and there's no water. But Everything changed not mm. long after that. Um, and what we're looking at here is actually a great example of, of um, how dust storms actually develop. So we're, uh, we're at a region not far from Longreach here. And this was a dust storm that we actually flew through. And we were actually looking for, it got a lot worse than what this was. We were looking for somewhere to land to get the hell out of it because it just got worse and worse. And, you guys have seen what some dust storms can be like. They're, they're horrid things. So we, we got around it, but you could see the areas of cleared vegetation as opposed to solid vegetation. It's just picking up the topsoil oh, yeah. and just grabbing it and taking it across the landscape. Um, I've been caught in dust storms before and they're, they're, they, they just engulf yeah. and hit you. But it is an example of one of the reasons why dust gets to the east coast. And why we need the vegetative cover. Um, so up in the right hand corner there, that yellowy colour, is that just an effect from lighting here or is that part of the dust storm? That's dust. That's oh. dust that was in the sky. Mm. So that's just the frags of low dust, but then it picks up and then it went up mm. and, and up into the, into the sky as Does well. Does it feel like you missed the main game of the photo? Sorry, I'm oh, not Oh, I know what you're saying. No, <laughs> it's interesting you say that. We, we had to fly around the dust storm, that's what I'm right. saying. We didn't want to fly into the yeah. dust storm, so we, we deviated and yeah. got, got the heck around it. So right. it, was, it was off yep. to one side because it wasn't a smart move to fly. Oh, look, I've filled out the risk assessments for work. Yeah, I know yeah. what it's like. Just <laughs> Yeah, but we certainly, we, we were chatting about what we were going to do depending on how big the dust storm yeah. was and where we were going to go. So it was a deviation, but I wanted to fly into it, you know, but that's just me. And I don't, I don't think there's any of my supervisors here, so I can just get away with everything and now in terms of workplace And luckily it's not being live streamed to the entire world, so no, no one will not. ever find so out, So we're safe as, <laughs> yeah. Yep, so that's what was going on there, Bernie. And um, clearly, you know, trying to tell a wetlands story, um, I also need to tell stories about what's going on in catchment areas as well. So we're now at an area near Longreach, you know, and again, completely dried out landscape. So, you know, we've got all our graziers out of water, hand feeding stock, low stocking rates. So this is sort of these add on stories to a, to a wet story. This is actually a dry story. Um, and they look like ants, I know, but mm. you know, I, this kept happening across the landscape and then you'd come into a river system suddenly there'd be this sort of contraction of a, of a waterway. But stock is, is a big part of it, certainly the central Queensland story and part of our economy. But graziers get hit hard when these sorts of things happen. It's a beautiful but tragic photo, but I can see clearly there's um, wheel tracks there and there. But are these other tracks, are they motorbike or are they no. cattle tracks? No, they're cattle tracks. Mm -hmm. So same line, yeah. straight to the water, yeah. water source, you know, and cattle need to drink. Mm. Uh, pretty much every day. Yeah. So that's what was going on here. Um, on top of that, you know, and these are these wonderful, this is another example of contraction. And it seems like we're talking not about, about wetlands, but it is part of the story of how species spread and breed and not just birds, invertebrates, fish, and everything related to um, species that hang out at these places um, when the water goes they move on and, and disappear. Mm. Um, so, you know, we, we were coming to the end of a, a protracted drought in 2019. Um, so it was quite a challenge, but 
an interesting thing to take on as well. That is stunning. Um, I guess this is another example of, of another arid zone, but we're in the far southwest now. So one thing that did start to sort of come out of this aerial sort of side of things is um, the land starts to take on a different uh, feel. It starts to actually not look real. It just yeah. starts to become a, a palette of colours. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful design, but the yeah. heartbreak that's in there, what's, is it really conflicting for you when you're taking it? I, I don't find it conflicting. I, f I find it challenging, but I also, uh, you're constantly taking on information about where you are mm -hmm. and what you're seeing. So I was, all the time I was flying, I was referencing where I was trying to, so I've got GPS coordinates for every one of these pictures. I know exactly where they were shot. I so, really hope you tell us every one of those coordinates. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through them now if you like, and <laughs> to, to three decimal points. Maybe in the question that. and answer. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this is again another example of an extreme location and an extreme habitat. Very little vegetation. Uh, the purpley tinge are gibber plains. So they're they're sort of low stones. Uh, that, that kind of smooth out as a result of wind and uh, erosion. So, and again, the higher you go in terms of how you shoot aerial photography, the more that pattern and colour starts to come into play. Mm. So I was constantly looking for little frags of water in there and vegetation lines. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic challenge. And th so this is part of the transect work yes. you shot? So that would be something they'd be able to compare with annually for 38 yeah. years and build a dynamic... Back to, back to the next one. And they, wow. they went again in, in 2020. And, of course, the game changed in 2020. So 2020, in terms of rainfall and what was happening uh, across Australia, was average. Mm. But still um, fourth hottest on record. So rainfall is one part of the equation, temperature is a whole other thing. But 2019, that increase in mean temperature was massive. It was almost two degrees. Mm. Birdsville had its hottest day on record in 2019. So, so mm. you know, there's, there, there's a, a number of things at play there, I think. Yeah. Shall we move along? Yeah, so the... What do we got next? Oh, we're still in outback Queensland. We're now at a location called the Diamantina River. Ah. Okay. Has so, anyone been to the Diamantina? Yeah, Diamantina, fantastic place. Probably one of the most remote places in terms of Queensland. You know, you've got Longreach, Mount Isa, Birdsville, and it's sort of smack bang in the middle. But the Diamantina River, and what we're looking at here, this is what's known as a dry flood. So what's gone on here in this uh, catchment, the rain has fallen in the top part of the catchment, and it's barreled down the Diamantina River, it's hit a point in the landscape where the, the river gets shallower and then it gets up and surfaces up and then just dissipates out into these channels, the channel country, which is, you know, one of the sort of dominant features of southwest West Queensland. We're still southwest, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. Um, so this river then heads pretty much due west. It does a turn here, it comes out, it's heading southwest and then it goes pretty much due west over towards Birdsville, and it keeps going. Spectacular. So this, this, la this landscape from the air, it looks like Moreton Bay when this sort of thing goes on. It's water as far as you can see. The, the, it, it goes blue, it doesn't go brown and red. So what's happening here? We've got no rainfall happening in this location, nothing. So Birdsville got two floods, and they were known as a dry flood. So they got no rainfall, so but nothing to flooded. benefit anything that's growing around, but just yeah. the inconvenience. Apart from the inundation of the water across yeah. and yeah. coming through. And so what yeah. happens with all that water when it does hit? So, so this water eventually heads, wow. as, as I mentioned, it, it jumps from those sort of deep-sided uh, rivers and then, and then turns into these channels. So and then just spreads across the landscape. Is, so is this further north in Channel Country or is this south? No, this is just around the corner from wow. where we were at the Diamantina. So the landscape changes and shifts, but ultimately all this water, it's all heading to Lake Eyre, to Catatandi, in, in the middle of Australia. Right. So this is all part of the Lake Eyre, Lake Eyre Basin and Lake Eyre Catchment. So it's um, a different river system to what you see on the coast because what it does, Lake Eyre is self-contained so Lake Eyre is the lowest point 
in Australia. It's uh, uh, 15 metres below sea level at its deepest point, and I think on the edge it's about 9 or 10. So the Diamantina River, uh, Air Creek, Georgina River, they all head into Lake Eyre. And they didn't we've get the memo to go out to the sea. They just, yeah, come inland. So it's yeah. what's called a closed system. Yeah. So it's completely different to what you see in the Murray-Darling Basin, which is a different river system altogether. Yeah. Sorry, Gary, I just need to know, because I think everyone will be interested, what Insta filter did you use to get that <laughs> coloration? Because that's pretty spec. Insta filter Gary Cranich, it's called. It's very, <laughs> very specific. How, that is gobsmackingly beautiful. What elevation are you at? Not, not that high. Really? I'm, I'm at, at six, seven hundred feet, quite low. In actual fact, we were flying really low when we did this survey. It's not a, it's not a two k, fifteen hundred feet thing. We were at, we were at about one hundred and twenty feet. So in terms of taking pictures, that's a whole other, a whole other game because the landscape's just belting past you. There's, you know? Because there are things in there that look like, like that looks like a cattle trail. Like it looks, it's, there's no scale there. It's so hard to. Yeah, and accept. look to, to the underwater photographers in the crowd, and there might be a couple. Do we have any can underwater it, photographers? Can, it, can anyone see brain coral? It's the same as brain coral, you know. Mm. And I'm an underwater shooter as well. That's yeah. some of the other little things I do. But that, straight away, the, the the link between the two is is quite amazing. I have underwater pictures that look just like that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what's um, gone on with that water. It's come across the landscape, then it hits the channels and spreads. But not all of the rivers do this, though, in, in, in the um, southwest. Some of them just dissipate and disappear. So not far from here, there's another ri river system called the Bulu drainage system, mm -hmm. right next to the Lake Air drainage system. It just gets to the border and it just goes... So it doesn't reach out. It doesn't go anywhere. It dissipates anything. across the landscape and breaks up into a series of pools, mm. uh, and and that's it. That's the end of that river system. So that's another habitat altogether. We yeah. could show show some of that work too, but you know we haven't got time for that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the day long Gary Cranich show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Where are we going to go next? I. Uh, oh. Oh yeah. So um. Cause and effect, Bernie. So what happens? We've got all this water going on. There hasn't been any rain for a whole long period of time. Everything's waiting, mm. water cranks in, animals start to breed up, and away they go. You get these massive sort of uh, flocks. Oh, I remember hearing about, you know, how the hell the pelicans know to, you know, to make their way there. And... Yeah, yeah. So, so this, this is the, a classic boom dust, boom, boom, sorry, boom, bust story uh, for Queensland. It, it's exactly what happens in these big cycles of six, seven years where species breed up. They go nuts like the pelicans do, as you mentioned. And there were lakes nearby where we were talking about earlier where the pelicans come in. And as you say, how do they know to get there? I don't know. I can't explain that today. Um, one thing about the survey and um, part of that aerial survey was how do you record the numbers of birds? <laughs> So I'm going to do a test for everybody in the room. You've got three seconds. How many birds okay. are on the screen? One, two, 400. three, gone. Too late, right? So how do you count the number of birds on the screen? So there's a, a recognised way of doing it. You divide this vision you have up into a grid of 20. A few people have picked up on it. You've got three seconds to do it, right? How many are in that one grid? And you multiply it by 20 or 40. So these guys are doing that in terms of the survey all day long. Was 400 the right answer, though? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, But that much. gives you an idea. But it is actually quite a... Um, it's, it's a fairly strong method of doing surveys yeah. of flocks of animals. Um, it's fairly well, well, well regarded as something that gives you some degree of accuracy as opposed to whatever. So, you know, I can see some people are now dividing the screen up. <laughs> oh, is he going to ask me how many, how many there yeah. are? There isn't a prize. Sorry. I don't have a prize for you. Um, I can give you a World Science Festival water bottle if it's not 400 in your mind. Wow. No expense <laughs> fared, eh? Hey? Yeah. All right. What are we jumping to? Yeah. Um, so Here we go. Look at this, Bernie. <gasps> you haven't seen these, I know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm jumping you a bit. So... It's Arid zone, no rain. This is a perfect example of an adaption. Yeah. Okay, so th this is a, uh, a burrowing frog. Um, they live underground. Um, it's called a crucifix frog or a holy cross frog. Uh -huh. This is at Thargaminda in the southwest. 
Um, I, was, I was doing some follow-up on some rain, a bit of a rain story here. And at this location, um, and these people are wildlife people, they hadn't seen this frog for six years. Wow. And as you can see, with legs like that, your range is not that big, you know. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to be a green tree frog and belt all over the countryside. <laughs> These things have got a range of about the, the size of the square of carpet, right? <laughs> so what they do, they, they basically live, spend most of their life underground. When the rains come, um, they emerge, they breed up, uh, the puddles dry out and they go back underground. Six years. So what they do, they, they, they reduce their heart rate surround their body in, a, in a, a mucus thing and go into this state of torpor for six years. Living the dream. How about that, eh? Yeah. So next time, you know, any of you have a bit of a whinge about lockdown. <laughs> yeah, thank God you're not a borough. How about that for lockdown? <laughs> so when you said before they hadn't seen this frog for six years, yes. they literally knew it was the same uh, one yeah, because yeah. of the limited range. Yeah. That is so, so Gary, yes. how, like, it's, did they alert you to the frog being there or did you just happen to be around and I was looking. I was looking for this species. I was there trying to get pictures of these because yeah. I knew, you know, we'd had some rain, things following up. I was yeah. certainly on, on the lookout for, for these Holy Cross and crucifix frogs. Yeah. How, um, how close? Because it looks like you were very close. Mm. I get close to all those sorts yeah. of things. And yeah, so yeah. they're not bothered, I guess, if they no, only pop no, up every six years, everything. Well, they're up and about, up and about for two or three nights, you know, yeah. do some breeding, go go crazy, you know, yeah. a bit like being locked up and then you head off to the nightclub and you go nuts and then you go home. And again. then there's another lock up. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you go again. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, perfect example actually of um, coloration. Yeah. That's and stunning. you know, anyone who has any um, any indigenous art, any any work from our traditional owners. Mm. Red, black and yellow, look at that. I mean, that, that is just straight. You can see where those inspirations come from. She's you know? a handsome beast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But a great example of a unique adaptation yeah. to uh, boom bust just extremes of, of climate and extremes of temperature. What have you got next, Gary? What have I got next? Okay, so obviously part of the arid zone, we're, we're talking about probably the quintessential Australian animal. Uh, There's a red kangaroo. Um, they're perfect examples of, of adaption, I suppose, uh, kangaroos. They move across the country really well. They don't have to drink every day. But kangaroos, and this is clearly a male, and if anyone in the audience thinks it's a female, we've got to have a chat. There's another talk, I'll... Uh... Yeah, that's a whole other talk, <laughs> right? But, um, yeah, it's clearly a male. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't work at the Stafford Tavern as a bouncer either, <laughs> um, but he could, clearly. So the kangaroos have this ability to control their breeding. So they can breed whenever they like. And if the season is low, if there isn't much food, they basically just suppress the embryo in their system. Again, this is a male, it's not a female. So, but these guys get to 90 kilos, huge animal. Um, What's their age range, do you know? I don't know, I think, I think we're talking 15, 17 years, mm -hmm. I seem, seem to think. But Generally speaking, there's a dominant male mm -hmm. uh, with, with a brood of females, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're the breeding, breeding king, mm -hmm. you know, and the males tend to punch the hell out of each other, you know. It's not a familiar story at it's, all. Uh, yeah, no. it's a little bit, little bit like, you know, mm -hmm. most sort of rugby league venues, that same sort of stuff happens. <laughs> um, and, you know, off they go. They, they become the alpha male in the system. Mm. But kangaroos are, are, you know, perfectly adapted to the, to the, uh, the arid environment, you know, yeah. in terms of how they go. Well... Talking of arid environments, and we can see what looks like a bit of a previous bushfire there. But um, <coughs> eucalypt forests, I think, are another um, another one of the environments we're going to look at. Well, that's right. I mean, in Queensland, it is you know that whole central kind of patch as we hit the dividing range and go a little bit to the west. Euc forest, eucalypt woodland. It's the dominant uh, landscape in in Australia, um, and certainly 2019 was a year where eucalypt forest in Australia was particularly mm. uh, front and centre. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that year of incredible dry weather led to the beginnings of the worst bushfires we've ever mm. seen in the country. Um, catastrophic bushfires, huge numbers of fires too across the country. Most of them started by lightning strikes um, and then pretty much they just enveloped 
the entire east coast of Australia and caused huge devastation. Big, you know, 30, mm. 30 35 people, loss of life, oh. property, massive. And the three billion um, wildlife that lost their lives in New South Wales as well. Yeah. That's right. And interestingly enough, though, you, I mean, fire is not a new, um, a new part of, mm. of, of eucalypt forest. It's actually part and parcel of, of what eucalypt forests are about. Well, a lot of eucalypts need fire to They need fire to germinate, but... You know the net. So what what happens is you know pretty much the whole understory gets wiped out, and you know uh, all of those grasses, sedges, low shrubby things they get burnt out. But ukes, ukes have this ability with their stringy bark and hard hard bark, and I'm sure there's a botanist in the in the audience as well. Um, but they can adapt to fire, mm. and they can handle fire. But I mean it's a perfect perfect way for a fire to spread. You know open underneath, you get in high temperature and high wind, no matter how much back burning, how many, um, you know, clear, uh, what's the, the word, cleared, you know, fire breaks that you put yeah. through, you're never going to stop the sort of wildfire that we saw in early 2020. And while you, um, eucalypt forests are, are fine with regular low fuel fires, I think we have all heard so many times now and we all get a sense that that catastrophic bushfire, the fuel load was too intense for... Well, well, the, that's right. I mean, the fuel load was massive, and and you know you had that um, elongated period of dry dryness. Mm. Couple that with um, high temperature, high wind, fuel load. Um, you've got a perfect storm. Mm. You really have. So, you know, there's there's been discussions about controlled burn, and was there enough controlled burn? There was actually quite a bit of controlled burning in 2019, mm. but at the end of the day. Um, you can only do so much with those sorts of things. Um, Justin Leonard, who's the CSIRO Head of Bushfire Research, I interviewed him last year for the ABC and he was, um, he was just saying that until we get back to pre-colonial cool burning patterns, this is the head of CSIRO Research, mm. um, until we do that we won't be able to um, manage fire <sighs> in this country again. Like it's just... The way we've set things up isn't working. So. It's a vo it, you know volatile subject. Not being yeah. it, it is a it is quite a volatile subject. Mm. And you know these are sorts of things that cross over borders. Yep. It's an Australia wide issue. And Dominant landscape as well in terms of you know certainly the east coast. Um, but the great thing about this kind of photography is it is evocative and it gives room for these conversations that we have to have. So. Absolutely. So it, interestingly enough, you know the net result and and people can get quite distressed about what happens in a eucalypt forest when it does burn out. It's wholesale destruction of, of all um, foliage. Mm. Um, and it looks like Armageddon. So this is in Queensland. This is not far from the border ranges. We did get quite a few fires here, as we all know. Nowhere near as many as, you know, the southern parts of the country. But, you know, certainly the experiences we saw... It was starting early in Queensland, actually. It's sort of around August we started to get fires in central Queensland same sorts of issues but this is what happens it looks like armageddon it looks like a first world war landscape that's I, sh been I should just let you know we are going to be looking at some pretty pictures again soon so. <laughs> but this is the reality of our but extreme environment. interestingly enough though a uke forest once you start and and look at this there's a little bit of rain has come through this is this same location um, this was probably about 10 days after the fire went through there. There was still smouldering going on, but you can see what's starting That's to happen. That smouldering that we're seeing. Yeah. I thought that was mist from rain. No, no, it's a little bit more smouldering wow. still happening, you know. So, so the net result is the uke forest has gone, right, oh, I'm going to crank it up. So they have this capacity to get in and, and go again. Mm. I mean, you mentioned earlier, Bernie, that some of the animals that, that did get hit hard, and certainly animals like koalas, mm. the reptiles especially got mm. hit hard. I, I know I need to talk to more of my colleagues about how the heck you measure some of those changes and what's happened. Invertebrate species really hit hard, no way of getting out. Um, Birds, no problems, off you go. Mm. But reptiles and koalas. But know. even, like we say, birds, no problems, but without their habitat, there's, like, black cockatoos have disappeared from parts of the Blue Mountains because the white cockies have moved in and Come taken, in. Yeah. you know? So everything, just the flow-on effects. Anyway, sorry, not No, my yeah, it's... <laughs> that, but there's story... This is the thing. There's yeah. interrelated stories yes. with all of these things. You know, fire is this part, yeah. and then there's all the parts that happen on the edges yeah. too. So... Whoa. And then very quickly you see this scenario. So in come these pioneer species that take over that, that churned up ground 
And before you know it, the Ute Forest is back up and going again. It can take some time, mm -hmm. but they do recover and do regenerate. So um, it was an interesting event in itself. Um, let's hope we don't see anything like it again. Mm. But I have to say, um, if temps keep holding where they're at, fuel loads keep going where they're at, who knows? Yeah. I think it's a safe bet, unfortunately. Yeah. Where are we now, Bernie? Um, well, I think we're about to take a look at some of the wetter areas mm. of Queensland. I mean, you're the one who took the photo, so you're probably I better be, I better talk, answer. Eh? See, I was trying to, tr trying to prompt Bernie All into right. where we we're at. I was just <laughs> going to give you a guessing game. All right, so now we've gone back to, we've gone back to the rainforest. Okay, so these are, these are a really unique uh, type of rainforest. These are mist forests, so these are in the wet tropics. Um, their whole game is pretty much 90% mist. Mm. Okay, so it's, it's, it deals with elevation and moisture. Um, and within that kind of habitat, there are huge numbers of endemic species. This is where Queensland is quite bizarre. There are mountain ranges where there are species that only occur there. Mm. There are places where only birds occur in Queensland on that one rainforest range. Ridiculous when you think about it. I remember years ago when I was living in Townsville and we went to Paluma and the satin... Was it the, no, the golden, Sat the golden bower bird yep. is only found at a certain height, and we saw one, and it's only in those. And that was the first I'd ever heard of. First you'd seen, yeah. yeah. So, so Queensland has these. This, you know, and I mentioned earlier in in the uh, chat, rainforest is fragmented in Queensland. It's not continuous. So there are these isolated islands and pockets, and it has led to high degree of endemic species specialisation on those peaks, and certainly animals that occur in these mist forests. Um, have um, have adapted mm. to that. Their plant, their, their food sources are only in these locations, uh, whether that be um, you know whether they're herbivores or whether they're fruit feeders, whatever they may be. So, I joined a um, I joined a survey team at, at these locations who work on the mist forests, and they've been sort of working for 20, 25 years. A guy called uh, Professor Stephen Williams from James Cook Uni. He's a um, he's pretty much looking at um, Elevation, uh, rainfall, and occurrence of species within elevation in rainforest um, localities, focusing primarily on mist forests, which is what we're looking at. So for 20 to 25 years, he's been running the same transects based on rainfall, temperature, but primarily looking at the arboreal species, the, the, the animals that live in the treetops. And he's been looking at things like Daintree River ringtail possums, so tiny range, um, three mountains in Queensland, a couple in PNG where these things occur. So you've got this, um, so he started to record them at around that 150 metre mark above sea level. So these mountains run at about 400 metres. And what he's found over the last 20 years is gradually as the climate has warmed, their range has gone higher and higher as the mist has continued to creep up higher and higher. So there's this sort of amazing study running the same transect, same location, and it's an exhaustive look as well. And he knows even individuals, and they've just gradually snuck further and further to the top of the range. And these animals have a really quite a small, small range, six, seven, eight hectares, not big. Um, and clearly there's gonna come a point when they run out of range. Um, but really interesting, highly adapted species that live only in mist forest. Now, I feel, I, I know I've been very chatty, so I'm just mindful of the time. How are we so. going? You all right? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, we're out on the coast now. Let's talk about the coast. Totally different habitat. But again, we're looking at major um, variances in what happens with water. You know, you've got localities where there's high salinity, uh, you know, those, those locations where the salt water comes in and shifts from being fresh water, goes to brackish. And there's unique adaptions within that as well. It's not the nicest habitat to be amongst, and we all know it's full of crocs, mosquitoes, crabs, and all those sorts of things. So I feel like you're at a safe distance. Here. We shouldn't really be in there, I think, as, is where that's going. So. Then, then as we move, you know, to, to these sort of coastal areas, I mean, Queensland hasn't, we haven't even touched on the coastline much. 
but, but the coastline of Queensland is huge. Just it alone is a whole book and story in itself. But so can you give us a sense of the scale that we're looking at there? Yeah, um, what can I pick up? But right, we're, we're probably looking at about 450, 500 metres. This is the Great Sandy Strait um, between Gari, Fraser Island and um, Kalula. Ah. So I was part of this whole wetlands game, wetlands story has been looking at the sites that are called Ramsar sites. So, mm -hmm. so these are internationally recognised uh, wetland sites. Queensland has five and the Great Sandy Strait is one of them. Um, but again, aerial game comes into it in terms of telling a bigger story, what's going on with pattern, colour and water movement and where it goes. Sandy straight. Um, part of the story of water too is, is how, how we use water um, and how important water is not only to, um, to biodiversity, to stock, but also to us as human beings in terms of um, water is very important to us. This is a town water supply. And this is in southeast Queensland. I'm not going to mention the town, but I'll let you think about that. This is what happened in 2019. There are a whole heap of places that ran out of water. And normally, this is massive. It's called a lake. Yeah, but that's the water supply. So yeah, this was shot towards the end of 2019. Again, it was one of my key localities to visit. And off you go, there's the lake. But it's, it's a perfect example of contraction and what can happen. And it's interesting, we've had rain recently, but it hasn't really filled the catchment mm. here in southeast Queensland either. Jumping along, you can't tell a story of uh, extremes and biodiversity without talking about the Great Barrier Reef. We could spend a whole other afternoon talking about that as well. But um, I guess it's it, another example of a habitat that can be affected hugely by things like land clearing, coastal runoff. We can talk about coral bleaching too, if you like. What's the time? Is there six minutes to go? Probably <laughs> not. But this is an example actually of the beginnings of coral bleaching. This is on Heron Island on the Southern Great Barrier Reef. Um, smack bang in the middle, you can see some little frags of white. Southern Great Barrier Reef pretty much avoided any bleach events, but certainly the top third, as we know in 2016, 17, was hit hard by bleaching mm. events. Basically, coral bleaching is caused by increased ocean temperature for prolonged periods throughout the summer. That's the reason for coral bleaching. Parts of the Great Barrier Reef are quite amazing too in terms of um, just sheer weight of numbers of what goes on there. Um, this is Rain Island on the far northern Great Barrier Reef. It's the biggest green turtle rookery in the world. So this is a, a nesting site. Wow and I've been there five or six times. It's hard to get to, and I say this all the time, David Attenborough rates it in its top five wow. places on the planet, and he knows a lot more than all of us put together. Not so. top five places for turtle watching. Top, top five, five to go five. to ever. Wow. In terms of experience, because it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's insane the numbers of green turtles that go there, so it's only green. They lay their eggs, they hatch, and then they belt out into the ocean <laughs> to, to live their life somewhere. Oh. No one really knows where her, uh, turtle hatchlings this size go. They, they're, not, they're not a herd, they're not a schooling animal, they just dissipate. Suddenly then you see them as sort of sub-adults about the size of a dinner plate. But that in-between period, no one knows because there's been no tracking, they're too small to track. I'm sure some nerd burger somewhere along the line will think of a way of doing it. <laughs> Maybe someone Language. at the science festival will think of it. I don't know. That's a project for those people, hey? But yeah, no one knows what happens to hatchlings. But survival rate, really small, 2%. Crunchy shark hamburgers, unfortunately, folks. Yeah, and of course, what's going on with all these hatchlings launching out? There's just <laughs> mm. nullas just sitting, sharks sitting out there just waiting. Some of the biggest tiger sharks you ever want to see are at Rain Island. So. Or you ever don't want to see. Yeah. Well, there weren't any behind me, not that I know of. So. <laughs> <laughs> but don't tell mum, all right? Yeah. So that was Rain Island, but oh. we're, we're, we're closing the gap here, Bernie. So this picture is, has sort of travelled wide and far for me, I guess. This is an image of coral spawning. So wow. this is... Um, I'd, I'd been trying to get pictures of coral spawning, and as most of you know, coral spawning happens once a year, usually five days after the full moon in October. Maybe, maybe, perhaps, just depends. And it just goes bam and it's gone. So I'd been in the water all night. 
I was just about out of air. So I shot this at about midnight. Um, and I was just bobbing in the water, hoping for some coral spawn to come through because I'd missed all the other bits. I was with some other people. Yeah. They were equally as frustrated. Yeah. And sure enough, in came this cloud of coral spawn. And it reminded me very much of Star Wars from 1977. <laughs> I think it's important to get a Star Wars reference into the World Science Festival <laughs> oh, as well. I like well. how you throw out Nerdburger on one hand. And then, and then I reference Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it, it's a perfect example, I suppose, of um, this is the only way corals can reproduce, mm. this through coral spawning. Eggs and sperm go into the water column, they head off, mix up, eventually become, um, I can't think of the word, I'm running out of words. Embryos. You know, yeah, yeah, embryos. Yeah, yeah. Wrigglers, yeah, come on, sorry, yeah, sorry. But yeah, and then they settle, and that's how coral reefs regenerate and form. So I was working on a project that was concentrating all of this coral spawn together, gathering it up mixing it in the lab and then concentrating it back onto degraded coral reefs. So this was with a big team. Wow. That's a whole other presentation yeah. <laughs> for another day. Yeah. That's great. There Gary. you go, coral spawning, Bernie. Yeah. Um, mm. Look, we're back on something that's not quite as pretty, aren't we? Sorry, folks, suddenly we were going pretty and now we're back on something that's not as pretty. So this is a coal mine in um, central Queensland. We've got about 40 coal mines. Um, Clearly, this is an area where we need to do some work in terms of how we're going to approach what we as a country do and how we look after our country. Um, the coal industry has been running for a heck of a long time and we are reliant on coal-fired power. Unfortunately, it also em emits quite a bit of uh, stuff that isn't real good. So, coal's a big fat ship that needs to be turned around, but we're not going to be able to do it overnight. Um, it's, uh, it's in the mix and we have to talk about it, but we've got to do something about it. I mean, there's been renewable targets set clearly for, for Australia and for Queensland. Queensland has quite, a, quite an ambitious target of 50% um, renewables by 2030. That's in nine years time. We've got a long way to go. Um, so big challenge over the next nine mm. years for us as a state to reach that. So coal is part of the game. Um, but certainly it can't continue to be the main game in town. And that's about as political as I get before putting my job on the line, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Mm. There you go. Cole, do you want to talk any further about coal, Bernie? What do you want to, what do you no, want to ask I'm, me? No, is huh? that where we're leaving it? Or? No, I no. think we've got one more, haven't <laughs> okay. we? We're nearly done. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, this is a future question, hey? Yeah, where are we going? What are we doing? I mean, COVID has taught us that... Um, you know, isolation can be good for some people and not so good for others. But it's certainly, I think, taught Queenslanders that we do live in a fantastic place. And I think the only way to appreciate it is not to stay in your little box, but to get out of your little box and go out and see it, understand it. You know, I, I, I do think a lot of us don't get out amongst the dirt, the rain, the dust enough, unless I'm preaching to the converted. I'm probably about halfway there. But yeah, COVID's been an interesting thing for Australia. We've dodged a bullet with it, really, mm. as we look at the news today to see what's going to happen over the next three days. It's good we're all out today because I think, yeah, something mm. may change. Anyway, that's, that's where, probably where I want to leave it, Bernie, well, uh, a, a question. Yeah. No, I think that's a really great place to leave it because those last two slides in particular are, I mean, there were some beautiful shots and some um, great sense of place and time and diversity that Gary's shared with us. But those last two shots really do open up the conversation, like I said, that we have to keep having. Would you give it up for Gary Krenich Thank you. and Extreme Environments? And, do we have any questions about the images, about Gary's work, about how to capture something like that while we're waiting? Just put your hand up if you have a question. Oh, good, there's a question. But, oh, Here good. we go, Bernie, up the back. <laughs> okay, and I, okay, so this is going to seem weird and make me look like an idiot, but because we're live streaming and videoing and you're not mic'd, I need to repeat whatever you say, even though we're all going to hear it anyway. So if you've seen Galaxy Quest, Sigourney Weaver's job, where she has to repeat the computer's commands, that's how smart I feel right now. So, your question, please. Yes, my, my curiosity is when you go to Bathhouse to South or Western Queensland, 
Oh, will you go back out to Western Queensland because it's because Ab it's flooding? Absolutely, and and it's interesting. I've already been back and revisited those locations locations with water in them. There are some other locations I didn't even touch on today, like the Gulf and the Cape, that I've photographed dry, and I'm about to, hopefully, go back to the Gulf and the Cape to go to some of those locations that have completely altered and changed with inundation. So that was always part of the plan, to tell both of the sides of the story. And 2020 has been a wet story, if you like, so I have revisited some of those, yeah. So, so you're getting closer to finishing the book? Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> and your question? Do you do any photoshopping with what you've shown us? Yeah, it's a good question. And Bernie asked me this in, uh, as we were chatting in the lead up, which is why my voice has been failing. But um, <laughs> yeah, we, we talked about how I deal with pictures. I have to shoot it real um, as a wildlife natural history photographer. The colours of those frogs, those um, reptiles, those landscapes. So I shoot raw files. So they're basically all raw files need post-production. Okay, it's different to a JPEG file, which is a compression file that you grab out of your camera. We're getting technical. No. Um, it's a compressed file that's been created in camera with, with actually post-production done on it by an algorithm in the camera. Okay, that's what a JPEG is. The camera's done a bit of jiggery-pokery for you. I've got that jiggery-pokery word in too. So raw files come out of camera with all of the data. You have to do post-production on them. Um, Photoshop is a different word. Photoshop sometimes, it probably started with a bad reputation. I think, oh, it's been Photoshopped. And, and that goes down the path of not telling the truth, I think, is probably where some people have a perception of Photoshop. Yeah. I shoot it real. This is real, what you see. Those colours, they're real. Yeah. It's in, I still can't believe that aerial shot after the rain. It's just phenomenal. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. What sort of shutter speed do you have to use to get those aerial shots? Good question. Aerial photography is, is, is about speed and motion. So you've got two things going on. You've got the aeroplane moving in one direction, you've got the landscape going in the other direction. It's a bit like shooting motorsport in many ways. So shutter speed up, a thousandth of a second, eight hundredth, absolute bottom I would go to to nail that sharpness then probably a fairly wide aperture, f4, 5, 6, that sort of thing. This is where these new cameras are brilliant because the, you can crank that ISO, which is the sensitivity rating of a camera up, and, and sort of um, you're able to then use quicker shutter speeds. So yeah, around that thousandth, that, that word I'm looking for. Yeah. Is there a um, when early white settlers? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So the question is: Is there a collection somewhere of early images of some of these places, either um, paintings or photographs, from when the first white people, I guess, went there? So our direct neighbours here, the John Oxley Library, they run a fantastic image library full mm. of historical images of Queensland. So they have a fairly broad cross section. Most of them tend to relate to. Um, industry grazing uh, transport, those sorts of things, but hidden away in the background is the story that you're talking about, mm. is what's going on with the landscape as opposed to what are the people doing. Back in those days, photography tended to be about what someone was doing. Do you know what I'm, mm. where I'm headed with that? So it does exist at the John Oxley Library. Um, there are other image libraries around the country that do have those sorts of collections, but John Oxley Library have the best collection of historical reference imagery in the state. Terrific. Oh, yep, your question? The, um, the land I know this, Bella. <laughs> the land department also has an enormous collection of aerial films. Oh, of course. Today, dating back to the, the earliest um, aerial photography, aerial survey photography. Yep, Computer so says the lands department also has a really great collection mm. of aerial photos, uh, aerial landscapes dating back to the earliest photography. And yes, oh, hang on a minute, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question who wants to before we start doubling up? Sorry, I'll come back to you in a sec, yep. Uh, with the tension there, is, is there a sense of whether that's growing, you know, becoming more vast in size or is it relatively 
Yeah, that with is. the Simpson Desert, Gary. Is there, <laughs> is, I told you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, with the Simpson Desert, is there a sense of whether that's growing in size or is it remaining static? I, I think there's certainly all, all, there's always shift with with those those sort of incremental shifts. But generally speaking, there there are barriers to those shifts in terms of um, landform and and habitat. Even physical uh, rivers will stop those sorts of things. So. I, I don't think you're talking, what we're talking about is, is massive, but I think there is some incremental shift happening, um, but not on a, a big scale, because the geology and landform actually mm. is, is one of the kind of key boundaries, if you like, to where a desert can begin and start. That's and not to say in lots of years it could change. And up the back, yeah. Oh, oh, top five in nice Queensland. Nice question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you briefly touched on the top five, uh, that according to David Attenborough, but Gary, what are your top five? Okay, top five. I love these questions because I have no idea how I'm going to answer, <laughs> but I'm ready now. All right, you have to go to the Great Barrier Reef. It is the responsibility of everybody in the room to do that regardless. So that's number one. Number two, you have to visit the Daintree Rainforest. You have to go to a desert region. It almost looks like I'm referencing everything in my <laughs> talk, doesn't it? Mm. After that, though, that's when it starts to get a bit interesting as to what you do. But I, I certainly think that whole reef, rainforest and, and red dust idea is, is a, a true kind of indication of Queensland's biodiversity. So I gave you three. I'll wriggle out of the other two. Maybe it's sort of some well, wetland areas. Well, I'm going to have a little um, quick follow-up, which on. is um, you said it's the responsibility of everyone to yep. see the Great Barrier Reef. Why? Yep. What should we do with it once we've seen it? Understand it. Lobby hard for anyone who wants to have a swing at it and look after it. Okay. Thank you. That was a Dorothy Dixer, if ever <laughs> I asked one. <laughs> and uh, um, yes, sorry. If we talk about going to see these places, doesn't that be increase the pressure on those places? Okay, so, so that's a, a question about loving a place to death, yeah? Um, yeah, that's a, that, that is an interesting uh, challenge for people who, uh, who try to show sensitive environments to um, visitors. Certainly locations like the Great Barrier Reef, you can have minimal impact in terms of visitation as to how you get there going by boat, floating in the water with a snorkel on your head, pretty close to the lowest impact you can get. Um, take aside, you've been in a boat, but you've had 260 of you in there. Sticking to the path, pretty obvious. Um, paths are maintained for people to walk on. That's what, what they're there for. I, the, the, I suppose the European model of locations getting loved to death through tourism is a different thing. We don't have that population uh, problem in Australia, so I don't think that is an issue here. It's still not to say that erosion on, on certain mm. sorts of areas doesn't cause problems. Certainly vehicles do that sort of thing. So I know where you're going with, with the question, um, but I'm still of the opinion that you are far more uh, informed if you understand what your impact has and by visiting that location, and they're all different. And making part of your story about going there, how you did it in a responsible, respectful way, I guess. I'm so sorry, because I know we still have some questions to go, but we do have to wrap right now. But Gary, you're happy to hang around for a few minutes and answer sure. people's questions one-on-one. -on -one. Would you join me in thanking Gary Krenich. Thank you. For a really beautiful and thought-provoking presentation. And um, when that Wetlands book finally comes out, Gary, we'll all be rushing to, to grab it. My name's Bernie Hobbs. It's been a real pleasure being here with you at World, Festival, World Science Festival Brisbane 2021. I hope you've enjoyed as much of you as you've been able to see of the festival. And I do want to just acknowledge that the Queensland Museum thanks its partners very much for, um, for supporting the events here and making them all possible. So get out there, enjoy the rest of the festival, stay safe, stay curious.